Hi folks, welcome back. We're in the workshop and today we're going to rewind back to the groundwork stage because it happened several years before we even thought about doing the timber frame. So stick around and we'll dig out the old footage. A little bit of an explanation on the build up here because I'm bound to get questions. Um, this was a lawn to start with on a hedge. All of that came off. All of the topsoil was taken away, maybe 150 mil or so of that. Uh, so we're down to kind of virgin ground. On top of that, we laid a, a, a landscaping fabric, like a tram, over the whole of this area where the slab was. And then on top of that, we started building up those layers. And because we had a slope land um, garden here, there was quite a lot to build up. And we're up about maybe 300 mil or more on this side. So it all had to be built up in layer after layer after layer. And we basically had the, all the type one sub base drops over the fence here. So I did it in three deliveries, I think. One of the last things to happen before the concrete arrived was to get the drainage sorted. This carries basically surface water from the bath path, not from the bath, from the path, but also from the garage flat roof. So it's important to get the fall on this right and I wanted to make sure that was all in place and bedded down before the concrete arrived and it wasn't going to float up or get nudged. So with that in place then I could move on to getting the membrane down and getting the final bits of prep done the day before. Uh, when the lorry was going to turn up. So we did decide to put some mesh in, it's all belts and braces, um, but because the land it had that hedge in and all sorts, there was a chance that things were going to settle over time. So it just gave it a bit more reassurance that it was going to stay as nicely as one. It's just borderline whether it needed a control cut in it uh, for an expansion gap. I decided not to, and bearing in mind the slab has been down about three years now, and there's not any sign at all of any movement or cracks or anything. So I think we're, we're pretty safe in the long run and that wire, uh, steel mesh is gonna help that as well. So concrete pour day came and this is the first time I've done this and there's only so much you can read up and watch about setting uh, or laying a concrete slab. And when it comes to it on the, on the day, you basically need twice as many people as you think, twice as many wheelbarrows as you think and uh, twice as much time as you reckon. So fortunately, the driver obviously saw the fear in my eyes. Uh, he was really helpful actually and was able to kind of vary the mix slightly and give us advice on what to do. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that I had, a, well, in, which, in my case, I had three different spots that if I had too much concrete, I knew I could use it, whether it's a shed base or in this case, it was path. So I had two sections of path and uh, you can see at this point, I had Will and Dad there that day and they were finishing off kind of leveling and screening out the slab and I'm there dragging what was left in the truck which turned out to be more and more and I'm trying to find various places to dump it and we've actually managed to do this really wide path all the way along the back and then a little bit extra which we uh, in the end made over onto a second path on that right hand side of the shuttering which basically will uh, lead up to the new workshop door, if you can picture that. 
Anyway, a few hours later, I was able to float that off. I hired a bull float and then I was able to do a bit of troweling on the edge. I think the timings were just about okay. It was a pretty boiling hot day to be doing it. Um, the main problem I had, I think, was I should have floated it off a bit better afterwards or troweled it off. So I didn't get a power float or a higher anything other than this bull float. That did a good enough job of smoothing things out and flattening it somewhat. But I think really there was a period of time between doing this and then trying to trowel it by hand in the evening that really I could have got a better finish. Anyway, more on that later in this video. The outside pass, we just did a brush finish just for a bit more grip and they've held up great over the years as well. So there you go, that gives you an idea of how we got to this point. So in summary, four or five years ago, cleared out the hedge and all the scrub and all of the topsoil went. Then we put about 10 tons of type one down in layers, all really well compacted. Then it lay dormant for a couple of years whilst we got on with other projects. Um, then sand, DPM, mesh and the concrete. Now the way I did the concrete was essentially a bit like a raft, so it's much thicker at the edges and because we've got sloped ground here you can see down in this corner it's about 300 mil thick and that's just where all of our timber frames bearing onto it it would have been fine if it was a level surface just to leave it at four or five inches or 100 125 mil uh, that is probably the thinnest it is in the middle but then it just thickens out near the edge now because all of our wall build up is external outside of the frame our frame finished pretty much level with the concrete all of this is kind of overhang, which is fine. There's no problem with that. And of course that sheds water away from our foundations, our concrete. That said, I'm gonna put some natural stone under here. So I'm gonna be putting a liquid DPM on here where the, DP, the original DPM is torn off. Here it's still intact, but again, I'll be putting stonework against that. So the, the concrete is really well set back and there's no real issue or chance of, of kind of moisture getting up through that into the floor. Um, but that's what it looks like on the deep side. The extra concrete that was left on the truck, I poured this path with. That was kind of like my last resort. If I had over-ordered, add this to uh, empty into. Turned out that I had enough to do that. This path and even <laughs> a stretch there, which is where the kind of the uh, sandstone sets are gonna join into the rest of the garden. Anyway, I've got a channel drain here, which is the reason why I've left this cladding slightly higher than the rest of the building. Um, but apart from that, we're all good. Finally, before we put the timber frame up, I've put some block work around. So that's just basically keeping everything 100 mil off our concrete slab. There is no, I mean, they are directly onto the concrete. That's fine because our concrete's got the DPM under it, but then the DPC separates the timber from the blocks. The DPC also folds down on the outside and is secured in position. So it's kind of all belts and braces, but that makes sure that this is off the surface. It means that also when we lay our final flooring, it can be brought up this side. Uh, it essentially gives us a bit of a basin in here. So if any water got in here, or if I wanted to even hose it out, there's an option there. And there's no real chance of this ever being in touch with anything damp. And then ignoring the fact that my block work is pretty terrible, the 100 mil upstand of blocks is also paint grade. Blocks, so they're a little bit smoother. They're about 10, 15 pence more a block from my local merchant, so it made sense to do that. Uh, that way, when I put the epoxy system down, I can actually paint those, that paint that whole upside the same. So again, it just means that everything's nice and clean, can be swept or hosed out. Right, hindsight with Tim. What would I have done differently if I'd um, thought about it three or four years ago? I probably would have just done a, a normal foundation, put a trench in, and put my block work or brick work up to kind of knee high. I would have probably gone a bit higher um, before the timber frame. I then could have just dealt with the inside afterwards and it wouldn't have needed to be quite as substantial. It could have just been a normal 100 mil um, concrete floor in here. I could have insulated um, and then poured the concrete, um, but either way, I've left it in a way that if I wanted to and this changed purpose, then it would be easy enough to probably add maybe 50 mil floating floor in here and uh, that would just make things a little bit more comfortable. I could have still done the external insulation and dropped that down the outside of any block work. So there wouldn't have really needed to be a cavity wall or anything like that. But I think just doing that would have probably made the groundworks outside easier, would have needed to bring in less concrete, less type one. Of course I'd need blocks. Um, 
the, the reason I went this route is one, I was more confident doing it. I, I knew, although it was the first time I poured a large concrete slab, I kind of knew the concept a bit more than traditional foundations back then. Also, because I hadn't designed the building yet, putting walls in exactly where you want them was a little bit more precise and it wasn't as future-proof as just having a six meter by five meter reinforced concrete slab because that just sat there until I needed to put the building up and I could almost design the building afterwards and knowing that I've got that size to work with. Um, I guess putting the walls in, especially if I had internal walls, I'd really need to think about the structure at the point of doing the foundations, whereas this was a really drawn out project so it didn't make sense to do that way. If you want a bit more info on the stages, then I'll put the old videos down below. They may or may not be more helpful, I'm not sure, but they showed certainly a little bit more of what was involved in getting the concrete delivered, what was involved in moving the concrete and the logistics of that, and then going way back to the point where we were excavating all the topsoil out and we um, and did all the kind of sub base and things like that. Anyway, that's all history. Now we're moving back onto the project. The concrete is not perfect. Um, of course, first time, and I was floating off as best I could, but it was a very hot day, and such is life, it didn't come out glassy smooth. Which, let's face it, it was never going to, being that it was the first time. But it's relatively smooth and level, but it's certainly gonna show up more when we put the epoxy down. All the imperfections will show up. So I've got a couple of options. One is to grind down any of the high spots and smooth things out. And I can do that, but in, well, mainly along this side, which is more noticeable when there was no roof and it was puddling, there are two, or, or pretty much the whole of that side is about five, 10 mil low, uh, which is a bit of a pain because if I'm wheeling stuff around on casters, whether that's units or tables or machinery, I want it to be pretty smooth. And also if you're ever assembling something on the floor, it's quite nice if that's level and flat and things aren't rocking. So what I need to do is bring that side up. Even if I knock off the high spots, it's not gonna correct that. Which means I'm probably gonna to have to do a bit of uh, self-leveling down over the whole thing. Something that I can take from two, three mil um, on the majority of it over to that 10 mil low spot. Anyway, so I'm gonna try and pick up some relatively heavy duty sort of um, industrial grade self-leveling. That means I can screw it out hopefully get a much smoother finish so that when we get the epoxy down it's going to look flatter and no rocking and it will just be a little bit of a nicer finish. I want to make sure though that any prep is done really well and that that really bonds well to this concrete. The concrete is super dry now, I haven't got any um, concerns there, it's just more a case of making sure as far as the, the, the impact or whatever the grading that the uh, newton meters or whatever that this screed is graded into that we go for a high one. So if we're using machinery or I bring a bit of the metal work up here with a little anvil, that I don't have to be kind of worrying about that. I'd rather just do it properly in the first place. You might also spot that I've now got a window over there. I just finished that. So that's glazed and uh, all fixed in place. I've finished cladding that north wall. So the next episode will probably feature that. So it's a little bit of the finishing off jobs getting that glass in and I'm now going to be moving on this week to both the floor and the beams because I want to get these beams finished nicely. Bit of sanding, routing off the corners and then we can move on to electrics and getting all of the dust extraction and all the services run around here. So um, lots to do but we're coming into land and hopefully we'll be able to move the tools in soon which means Jo can have her studio which means a lot of cabinets to build. So I think April is gonna be fitting out this room and the studio, getting cabinets done, doors done, storage, shelving, electrics, lighting, dust extraction, all sorts to come. Thanks for watching, remember if you can, do it yourself and we'll see you next time.